Hey there, Holly Show listeners. Like a ghost, David Schrader has continued to haunt our show as a multiple guest. We uh, last had him on episode 92 with Peter Murrieta, where they talked about their comic book, Rafael Garcia, Henchman. With Halloween just around the corner, it's only fitting that David has appeared again, this time with Clay Adams to talk about their cinematic horror comic anthology, Nightmare Theater which is currently available on Kickstarter until Thursday, November 19th, 2020. Welcome to the show, David and Clay. Thank glad you. Thanks for here. having glad us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's nice to uh, hear from you guys. And um, why don't you go ahead and uh, give a brief distru- uh, introduction of yourself and uh, let our audience know some of the projects that you are known for. I guess we'll start with Clay, since this is your first time on the show. Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, I'm Clay Adams. I am a writer, actor, and director. Um, best known for voice acting in shows like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fast Forward and uh, several seasons of Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm a co-founder of Fried Comics, which uh, we create offbeat, irreverent pulp fiction. We've been doing that since 2013 with books like PBOW. You can look up what that means. It might be a family show, so I won't say the name. Uh, Red Xmas, which just got picked up by Scout Comics, and uh, will be in comic shops this December. Uh, so Red Xmas number one, look for that in your comic shop. And um, our other book is Dead Skins, which uh, we successfully crowdfunded uh, the first couple of issues, uh, remastering our old webcomic earlier this year. We're about to launch uh, issues three and four very soon. So uh, that's me. I'm thrilled to be on the show. Cool. David. Uh, yeah, I'm David Schrader. Uh, I am the co-creator and writer of Baby Badass. Um, it came out through Action Lab Danger Zone a couple years back. Uh, volume 2 should be out in 2021. Um, filmmaker, writer, um, had the 90s slacker film NoHo, uh, the shorts being Ozzy Osbourne, Come and Knock, the other Ray Charles, and upcoming feature, Mary Tyler Millennial, which I'm very excited about. should be out in a few months. Um and I have co-founded a company called Highbrow Productions. You can see all of our uh, crazy skits, bits, and make ups on YouTube. Nice. And um, since this is the first time that Clay has been on the show, uh, why don't you give us a little bit of your origin story? Because uh, like all our superheroes, they all have origin stories. So, uh, All right. Where did you grow up and what were you into when you were 15 years old? So I grew up in a suburb of Atlanta. And um, I was super into comics from an early age. I started um, started watching like the Batman TV show and Super Friends and all that stuff. And that sort of led to picking up the comic books and really digging Batman. Um, loved Batman. I happened to be picking up uh, Batman like right when year one was coming out. So that was like the perfect time, you know, to be getting on board. And that sort of, uh, you know, that carried me through for a while. Like by the time I was 15, um, I was probably, I think I was still reading comics. In fact, at that point, starting to get into more of the Vertigo stuff, um, picking up Hellblazer. And, uh, you know, my, my tastes were, were less towards comic book or less towards superheroes, but still, still comic books and, and leaning into that horror. And I was discovering things like uh, Psycho, um, the movie, as well as the book by Robert Block. And, um, of course, that that led to marathons of Psycho 2 and 3 and then Psycho 4 when it came out on Showtime. Um, really, I, I really liked, uh, you know, those, those old slasher movies. Um, also, a- anything with Chucky in it, uh, I would go, <laughs> go watch in high school. Um, so this, this uh, is a bit of a homecoming for me because I, I really like you know, slasher movies and horror films and horror comics were just a big part of, uh, of my youth. So, uh, so to be able to make one is, uh, is pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. What were some of the horror comics that you, uh, read when you were young? 
Yeah, so, um, you know, Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, of course, is uh, just a, an amazing book. Um, but, uh, but probably um, before I even got into Swamp Thing, I think I probably discovered Hellblazer first. And I think it was, um, it must have been during Garth Ennis' run. Um, right as Steve Dillon was coming on, I think that was one of the first issues of Hellblazer I bought. Uh, it was one of Steve Dillon's first issues. And I just remember just being blown away by it. Uh, I mean, besides the beautiful art by Steve Dillon, um, you know, Garth Ennis has a way of just, you know, grabbing you and his stories are, they're just very visceral and you feel them. And, you know, just, of just, he has a, that dark sense of humor that as a kid, uh, you know, as a teenager, I was just really drawn to. Um, and then of course that led me to kind of go back and, and read the, the, Jamie Delano uh, version and and that um, you know I, I think his first issue of, of Hellblazer is is phenomenal. Um, I, I always there there's a scene in that book that I always think of um, that that just has really stuck with me of a character named Gary Lester sitting in a bathtub and he's he's covered in bugs and and he thinks it's a drug trip. And he's like, you know, John, you got you got to help me, man. The the bugs, they're crawling all over me. But he but he he thinks it's just, you know, he thinks it's just a bad trip, but it's actually real. And um and that that image has really stuck with me. Um, I I think that was a a fantastic piece of writing by Jamie Delano. So probably probably Hellblazer and Swamp Thing were really the big ones I was reading in high school. Nice. Um, how about you, David? Well, were there any comics, horror comics, that had an impact impact on you when you were young? I believe that my brother probably had some like swamp thing um, uh, issues laying around. Probably a few tales from the crypt. Although, honestly, horror comics to me, I didn't read a, a, a lot of that or see a lot of that. It was my introduction to horror was probably when I saw Salem's Lot on TV and when I was nine, and that terrified me um, to the point where I. It was probably not till The Shining that I really like watched another horror film. Like you know, I think that affected me at an early age. So I didn't seek out horror comics um, at a younger age, and even to this day, I don't um, I don't particularly like gravitate to horror. But it just seemed like the the right thing to do with this um, with this project is to uh, to kind of like go into that. Um, with all the creators, the amazing creators we had, and, and the love of horror that people have. Yeah, you had like at least what thirty over thirty five creative teams There's working 30, on it. Yeah, thirty five creative teams. It's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, we'll we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, uh, Clay, I mean, you mentioned that you were an actor and a voice actor and, and a director. Um, would you mind describing your your creative journey um, and those creative endeavors as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I started acting when I was really young. I was about eight years old when I booked my first gig. I p was playing a grandson in a um, in a commercial for a retirement home, and uh, it was a non-union thing. I probably made about forty bucks for it, but it, at that time, it just seemed like a crazy amount of money, and uh, and I really just fell in love with it. And so I started. Um, I, I started working all the way through high school. I was doing commercials and radio voiceovers and equity theater and uh, and really just enjoying it uh, so much. And then I went to college uh, at NYU. I did a double major with dramatic writing and acting. And I, I got out and immediately started working production on some films that were shooting in New York. And after doing that for about a year, I realized I didn't uh, I didn't love the production end of it. I really missed being in front of the camera, and so I I left those gigs and started um, started pounding the pavement as a young actor in New York, doing a lot of theater, slaughtering the classics for little to no pay for about a year and a half, and. Um, then I was lucky enough to break into soap operas. I, I booked a, a three-episode arc on One Life to Live. And um, that led to me booking some other soap opera work in the city on All My Children and As the World Turns. And I had just had recurring roles on all three shows, so I would just bounce around between all three. And I did that for many years. But one day in about in 2003, I was on set at As the World Turns, and uh, we finished a scene, 
and they were moving on to the next set, and one of the lead actresses pulled me aside and she said, hey, listen, uh, my husband is co-directing a horror film out in Los Angeles, and uh, he's having a tough time finding the lead. I think you'd be perfect for it. Can you put yourself on tape? And uh, so my wife worked on the show at the time, and so she she took me up to the production offices and uh, and put me on tape. Uh, all the suits thought she was being attacked by a raving maniac, and we sent the tape out to L.A., and lo and behold, I booked the gig. So I went out to L.A. to shoot this feature, uh, which was called Bloodline, and I get there, and I meet the, uh, the co-writer, co-director, Keith Kaloris, but I also meet... Uh, the other co-writer, co-director, a man by the name of David Schrader. Oh, nice. <laughs> and, uh, and we shoot the film. It's a, it's a great shoot. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a cool little horror movie, uh, called Bloodline that was released by Lionsgate. And then I went to, um, on to do another movie, another feature, horror feature called The Shadow Walkers, which was also released by Lionsgate. And then shortly after that, uh, I wound up booking um, a role on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Fast Forward, uh, which is a uh, kind of an offshoot of the Ninja Turtles where like I, I played this uh, this genius in the future. I'm like the great, great grandkid of Casey Jones and April O'Neil, and I, I bring the Ninja Turtles to the future. So we had uh, one season of that. Um, I like to say that I was the cousin Oliver of the Ninja Turtles. Um, I, I don't think that that iteration of the show was particularly popular, but I got my own action figure out of it. So that's cool. Um, and uh, eventually the Turtles went back to their time period and, and Cody Jones, which is my character, disappeared. But then I started doing uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! I did a f several characters on that and Pokemon. And I, I did that for years and years and years before... Uh, before finally um, going back to my roots and and doing comics. Yeah, I mean, what age were you when you said, you know, one day I want to create comic books? Oh man, I I, I mean, I, probably about the same age I started acting. Like I was the kid who was always writing and drawing his own comics. Um, you know, instead of going out and playing baseball or tag with all the other kids, you know, the kids would come over and knock on the door and and I would try to get them to make comics instead of doing what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, probably about eight years old. I mean, I, I remember I even sent in a pitch to uh, Dick Giordano at D.C., um, you know, when maybe I was 10 or 11 and, uh, you know, of course, did not get any kind of response. But um but I knew, you know, even back then, that this was something I really wanted to do. And, you know, I think just, uh, you know, in my early 20s, being so focused on on acting, I kind of, you know, went away from that. But at, at some point, um, you know, after achieving, you know, certain goals as an actor and and also kind of looking for things that I could do, like voiceover, one of the things I love about voiceover is that, you know, you can do that from anywhere. Um, you, you don't have to get dressed up. You don't have to do hair and makeup and all that stuff. Like you just kind of go. And, and in fact, I, I recorded some episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh, like entire seasons of Yu-Gi-Oh just from my closet at home. Um, so that was great. I got, I have a couple of young kids and, um, and so something about, you know, what can I do at home? So I'm around for the kids if they need me. Um, you know, so, you know, what an addition to this voiceover stuff. And, uh, and I just, you know, comics really sort of seem to be the answer. Like I, um, I always loved writing. I always loved making comics and, and just kind of started gravitating towards it. And it's just, um, uh, yeah, I just, over the last several years, I've discovered that love again. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, why don't we, uh, sort of segue into the, uh, the anthology. Um, can you both describe the initial conversation you had with each other when you thought about conjuring up this unholy anthology? <laughs> Dave, do you want to take that one? I've been chatting for a while. Uh, no problem. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think me and Clay knew we wanted to do some kind of project together. And we'd worked on uh, a, a script for a comic called um, The Infinite Reflector, this sci-fi thing. And, you know, it's still... It's still in the early stages, but we knew that we wanted to come together to do a, an anthology. And the question was like, what, you know, what kind? And so, you know, all the people we both met over the years at the cons and, um, you know, 
you establish these relationships with these creators and these artists, and there's so many of them that are just awesome. The idea was, well, let's see how many of them we can get together for an anthology. And the idea to do it as uh, a type of film festival. So, you know, the book is structured with these hosts and, um, you know, you can have different sections of the book for different types of subgenres of horror. And so making it a cinematic horror anthology was just the idea that um, we could probably get the the widest scope of stories uh, from that kind of framework. And then we wanted to add these hosts, like Shelley Post Stoker is the host. She's this Frankenstein, Victorian kind of monstrous and two other terrifying tropes. And that was a way to kind of just make this uh, a cohesive type of book. And so Clay has just been great at, uh, you know, getting everything together and, and getting the Kickstarter up and running and, you know, just compiling all this amazing talent. So that was the real thing as an editor to, you know, look at the stories as they come in, see what works, um, maybe doesn't overlap with some other story that's similar. Like we, we wanted to make sure that we had like a wide variety and I think we really were lucky in getting these amazing people together to do this. When, and, when, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Dave is being uh, very modest as usual. Uh, he did a ton of work bringing people together. In fact, he he probably did the majority of the recruiting. Um, and uh, just, yeah, as he was saying, just some some phenomenal talent on this book. We, we, uh, we asked a lot of great people. Uh, never in our wildest dreams imagined that they would essentially all say yes. Uh, but they did, and now it's we've a, got, it's a big, we've got a it's monster a very of a book. book. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we said earlier, it's over two hundred twenty-five pages. That's incredible. Yeah, and some of the creators, like you know, some of them, like Sean Gaborin and Dave Dewanch, like they have some deep horror bona fides. Um, but others are just great creators, and they don't necessarily uh, have horror books, but they just write great books, mm-hmm. uh, like David Pepos, uh, Jessica Maison, Charlie Stickney. Uh, Newton Lillevoix, who does Crescent City Monsters, which is amazing, has a story in this. Carla Nappi, Richard Fairgray, who is just really amazing and eclectic. David Avalone, who does do like Elvira, uh, Mistress of the Dark, and, and Drawing Blood. Like he, he's got he's got some horror um, credentials, but a lot of these people are just amazing. There's just too many to name. Like uh, M. L. Miller, Stephen Prince. Um, yeah, it's 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 Tony Fabro who does a three panels crime, uh, like an extended three panels crime, which is really cool. So we just wanted this like, um, you know, wide net that we cast and everyone kind of came aboard and uh, couldn't be happier with how it turned out. Yeah, I mean, a lot of your uh, your writers and creators have been guests on our show. I mean, you even have Terry Mayo on there. That's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, Russell Nolte, <laughs> Don the Wind. Yeah, uh, it's it's incredible. Even have a, a limited edition movie poster uh, for the hardcover by um, by our Orlando. good bu- yeah by our good yeah. buddy Orlando Mexifunk Arocina. Yeah, and I I want to definitely give credit to you, Aaron, because I think you introduced us. Um, and once I saw his stuff, I was a big fan and like followed him on Instagram. I was like, this is incredible. You know, I, I'd known a vector art, but it really had uh, kind of a dated kind of reputation. I think at one point. And he's just, you know, he's won awards for his art and he's taken it to such a level that I've tried to have him do something for everything I've worked on. He did do a baby badass cover that Mm -hmm. will be out for volume two, but he did an incredible one for Henchman uh, that I did with Peter Murrieta. And then this one was fantastic. It was a vintage movie poster. It's reminiscent of like a Bride of Frankenstein or one of those late 30s, early 40s movies. And um, yeah, it features our characters, but it's really, really beautiful. And it'll be one of the hardcovers, but also offered as like a fine art print. Yeah, he's uh, he's definitely one of my favorite artists to follow. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I've known him since I think 2014. And um, yeah, I mean, even his, his, um, his foray into vector graphics, uh, he's sort of an ambassador for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know in our conversation that we had back in 2014, he talked about his um, his sort of his want to turn vector art into a viable uh, art medium because at the time um, it, it, hit, it hit a lot of roadblocks um, concerning its portrayal as a, as a valid art form. You know, mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot of fine artists were sort of poo-pooing it 
uh, to some regard. So, oh, well, I think he blew that out of the water. Exactly. I mean, all you have to do is look at his Instagram. And mm-hmm. I mean, he gets hired to do big campaigns and big accounts. So we've been very lucky and I've been very lucky that he's so kind to uh, take the time to, to make uh, art for, for uh, our projects like this. Yeah. And he's, he's all the way in uh, Columbia. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and then also I want to mention Sora Sung, who has a, a campaign out for her art book right now uh, did a cover called Box Office Death that features our lead character. So uh, Leah Goldberg did this amazing oil painting uh, cover. So we've got quite the quite the uh, the gamut there, and in, including Kyle Roberts' original uh, cover. So great artwork for the covers. Uh, also some interior stories with these characters, and then just a chock full of all these amazing other creators. Now, when did you guys start actually planning the anthology? Probably about a year ago. Um, At least, yeah. Yeah, we started talking a long time ago. We knew we wanted to do an anthology. We knew we wanted it to be horror. And uh, so we knew a couple of things. I mean, we knew that um, we knew that an, an anthology was going to take a long time to put together. We wanted to give pl- pl- people plenty of lead time to put these stories together, to really make sure they were in great shape. Um, and then we, of course, also knew that, uh, hey, October is a great time to launch a horror book because, you know, everybody's in a in a spooky mood. So um, hmm. so we decided, yeah, let's, you know, I, I think sometimes with creative projects, there's this uh, there's this feeling like, no, no, now let's get it out now. You know, let's hurry, hurry, hurry. But we wanted to make sure we took our time with it. Really, like I said, give give the creators time to just come up with the best stories that they could give them plenty of time. So, you know, if they weren't available immediately, they might have some time, you know, further down the line. Um, and I think that really worked out for us, just kind of taking the long view and, and slow and steady wins the race, man. Yeah. So what were some of the things you did to successfully manage the 35 or so creative teams? I think mm. um, initially it was just putting the feelers out. You know, getting um, uh, getting the word out to as many creators that we really wanted to be involved with as possible, and just to see their, you know, whether their schedule permitted or what their interest was. And then it was the idea of like, okay, let's get your story ideas. So we try to set deadlines for people to send in what their story ideas, and and, and at that stage, you're able to then um, separate maybe some stories that are too similar to each other because sometimes people had like two or three different ideas of what they wanted to do. Um, and so it was more of like the calling of that, uh, and setting the deadlines and then you start getting the actual written stories in and then you get the artwork in. And honestly, I don't have a, I mean, I have project managed in my life for work and and things like that, but, uh, I don't have an experience doing this as like a publisher with stories, but my limited exposure to comic books and how they work and, and how, you know, getting my art in on time and all that other stuff has helped me. And then Clay has a ton of experience with that. So I think just getting that, those initial stories in, seeing where it's going and trusting the people and and the creators that you're involved with that they'll get it done. Um, and then knowing that there's a cutoff for, for when we'll need this stuff to make sure that everything gets out on time. Mm -hmm. Uh, were there any problems that you had to solve that, uh, you could share for other people to learn from? Not a whole lot of problems. Like the the biggest thing for me, like Dave said, was just kind of going through those uh, synopses that people would send in, you know, the pitches Mm -hmm. and just really making sure that there's there's not overlap And, and not even like. Um, you know, thematically, it's fine if there's overlap, right? But but we didn't want to have very similar style stories. Like we didn't want a million vampire stories. We didn't want a million werewolf stories. You know, it's like you got one. It, you know, if you if you like it, you got one. Um, but we want to give a wide cross section um, of of all these various types of subgenres. So I think that was really. I mean. It, it wasn't really a problem. It was more of just something that we had to stay on top of. And um, and so, you know, we we did have a couple of different stories that that were thematically similar. But if they were if they were different sub genres of horror, we knew that they were going to come out different enough that we didn't need to be like, all right, we you know, we we don't need to see that because we want to see, you know, some of these primal fears expressed or put on the page in very different ways. Um, because I, because I do think it, you know, at the, at the, at the core of it, horror is, is sort of ultimately about these primal fears. And so, um, and so I, I think thematically there are only 
so many places you can really go for effective horror, but what it is is that you dress it up in these different subgenres. So um, this is a long-winded answer for, for at least on my part to say that uh, that I didn't think it was uh, that there were problems per se, but just more of that that management and, and just making sure from the get-go that we had a wide variety of stories. I, I don't know, Dave, do you, do you feel differently? Is there? No, no, I, I think that's right. Uh, I mean, I think we preempt any kind of problems by choosing people that are professional, that are nice people, good people to work with, like, and, you know, you kind of just trust that. Um, you know, I think if you open it up, and this one we didn't really open up to, like, submissions. It wasn't that type of thing, because we knew so many talented creators already, so I think it wasn't necessary. Maybe if we do a volume two somewhere down the line, that would happen, and you might work with people or an artist somewhere around the world that you don't even know, and maybe the art gets in late or something, and those kind of problems, but I think starting early enough you have to start early when it comes to something like this. Uh, and we didn't know how big it was going to grow into, like the size of the book and how many stories. Because, you know, it could have easily been half this this many people. And it still would have been a hefty size book. But I think you're getting a lot of bang for your buck as a, as a Kickstarter backer when you back this book. And I think, like, the quality of the content is going to be apparent. Now, without giving too much away, I know that both of you teamed up for a story in the book. Uh, do you want to talk about that uh, a little bit? I think you created it with the uh, artist uh, Ismail Canales, right? Yes. Clay, you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. So the story is called Nightmare with a K. With a K. <laughs> yes. Some some medieval horror. Um, and this is actually, this is based on a story that uh, Dave and I actually worked on uh, last year, um, a, a bigger, longer story. Uh, that we pared down to eight pages uh, for this uh, for this anthology, and it's um, it, it's about a group of teens that that sneak into this uh, this dark ride that's been closed uh, at a theme park, uh, and uh, the the ride's been closed because uh, a horrible accident occurred there many many years ago, and uh, it's never been run again since. But uh, but the the legends around this ride have really grown up in this community and uh and it's supposed to be you know the scariest ride ever and and the souls of the people that died on the ride are supposed to be trapped inside and so uh this group of teens decide that they want to go for a little joy ride and they break <laughs> in and they're gonna they're gonna ride the ride uh, uh for the first time since it's been shut down and uh things go awry uh i won't give anything away but um <laughs> But I, I think this does for dark rides what Friday the Thirteenth did for campgrounds, and it's a uh, it's a fun little eighties style slasher. Yeah, it's a late eighties slasher. It's based on a story called Nightmare, class of eighty eight, and um, I think we got the core of the story in, into this short. Um, basically, it's it's like kind of the best of, and uh, Clay did a great job in kind of condensing it and getting it put together, but. Ismail's art is incredible too. We lucked out. Like we were looking for artists for quite a while and we got this guy, he did some samples and he was just fantastic. He also colored it. Um, but it really captures that like late eighties slasher movie feel. And, and this is one of the few stories in the book that has, um, some of the slasher stuff. And, uh, yeah, I think it, it I think it turned out really, really, really great. We're, we're excited to like have people see the story. And what I like to always say regarding his art is that uh, it even kind of reminds me of George Perez from like that late 80s <laughs> that style. 80s run. Yeah. Um, totally does. You see it like in the curls, like in yes. uh, the, the girl's hair and stuff. So, like, it's, it's totally the curls. It's the yeah. Wonder Woman, you know, type <laughs> <It's> girl. <fantastic. laughs> and, uh, and so I, I thought that was just really a perfect touch. I felt like we really lucked out with him. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, I guess we can maybe delve a little bit further into the actual Kickstarter campaign. Um, do you want to highlight any of the any of the pledge levels? Sure. Uh, real quick, we had the original oil painting uh, that Leah Goldberg had done, but that sold out right away. That was our most evil tier. So we're going to be adding more. I think the original art tier also sold, and there's not a ton of original art for the story because or for the book because. You know, it's only the art that Kyle Roberts did that does the interstitials and the, like the framing of the film festival. Um, but it's amazing stuff that he's done. So some of that original art is going to be going up on a tier soon. We're going to be adding a few uh, stretch goals, I'm sure, at some point. 
Um, but yeah, besides that, Clay, is there any other tiers or you want to dominate or <laughs> you want to dominate? <laughs> I, you, I would love to dominate. Dom- you got to yeah. dominate the space. Allow um, me to dominate. You that you uh, want to? Uh, I don't even know what I was trying to say there. That you want to dominate? <laughs> uh, yeah, let, 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 uh, I'll dominate. So um, I I would say the the hardcover really is uh, is sweet. That uh, you know we we talked about the the Mexifunk cover it's got the uh, it's got the poster but you can also get that combined with uh with an actual 11 by 17 movie poster mm-hmm. and uh that's turned out to be a, a really popular pledge that i think um you know uh i think people are going to be happy that they got because it's just going to be a really nice package um so i'd, I'd probably you know uh, you, you got it the thing is, there's something for everybody. Like we've got the Sora Sung cover, we've got the Liad Goldberg cover, we've got the gorgeous cover by Kyle Roberts. Um, it, you have so many different covers to choose from from the trade paperback. Um, but if you want a, a little, you know, the the high end hardcover experience with the with the movie poster, I'd probably direct people there. And then, um, or if you just if you want to go crazy and get every single cover, um, we do have a package called the Killer Collection for 150 bucks plus shipping. Um, you can get all of the covers. And uh, that is actually proved to be uh, a, another popular tier. Um, and uh, it, it's great because we priced it so that you're getting uh, the same deal that we gave early bird backers on some of these books, plus the, the poster free. So, uh, so that's a really fantastic deal. Did I dominate? You dominated the space. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. And besides that, we may have some surprises, some other creators that uh, are, I don't want to say late additions. They were involved early, but we weren't sure. So we were holding out and it looks like it's, it's possible. We may announce that sometime soon. And um, uh, our lead character, Shelly Post Stoker, who does this amazing video, almost like a you know like the hostess of this, of this film festival? Mm-hmm. Uh, we may have a like a cosplay cover for for that as well, and it could be introduced somewhere uh, during the campaign, maybe around Halloween. So uh, keep your eyes out for that. Awesome! Can't wait to check those out. Um, I guess this is a good time to jump right into the thunder round. Um, you guys ready? We are. Bring ready. it! Bring the thunder! All right. Um, it's it's about uh, two forty five right now, and um, I didn't eat any lunch, so I'm kind of hungry. So uh, I've been craving a burger lately. Uh, describe your perfect burger. Ooh. My perfect burger is medium rare. Probably has uh, some blue cheese on it. Um, maybe, maybe even mushrooms? Is that a thing? Whoa. Is that crazy? Would you have mushrooms with blue cheese? Hell yeah. I don't know. Now I'm just making a sounds... Frankenstein burger. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> Um, and then probably a nice, uh, just a nice artisanal bun, we'll say. Artisanal, artisanal bun sounds good. Um, it used to be, I loved Shake Shack. I mean, I loved In-N-Out Burger, and I loved Shake Shack's burger. But I kind of stopped eating red meat for, I don't know, it's quite a while now. So I will either do like a Beyond Burger or a Turkey Burger or something like that. But to me, you got to go ketchup mustard lettuce tomato on a good bun and that's that's the burger either that or like thousand island which is like the uh you know the the special sauce or the the in and out stuff too so yeah that's 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 good i'm not too fancy <laughs> yeah just nothing wrong with a basic burger yeah basic burger lettuce tomato though right no pickles two pickles all right two. You, you got me two pickles <laughs> let's put those on there sweet um in a zombie apocalypse what would be your weapon of choice uh, I I would probably go with Nightmare Theater just because um, uh, it's <laughs> – we joked on another podcast that you could kill somebody with it's this book. Big, it's so a heavy. It's big enough that you could actually murder someone. Yeah. It's yeah. So I'd Good maybe – Wait a – very yeah. subtle. You're very, very, very sly. You put that in there. Well, that is pretty good. I, I'm, I'm trying to dominate the space. <laughs> you are so. dominating the space. Um, I would go with sawed-off shotgun. I think that's probably I – don't, I don't really like guns, but – during a zombie apocalypse, that could probably be fairly effective. Yeah, I think what you and Cypress Hill would be teaming up together, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, speaking of Cypress Hill, um, you're going on a long road trip. 
what songs would you put on your playlist? Okay, so I would for sure have a heavy rotation of Van Halen. And I'm not just saying this because uh, Eddie just passed. Rest in peace, Eddie. Um, but, uh, but I would definitely be blaring plenty of Van Halen, mostly old school with Dave, but I'd work in the occasional Sammy tune. <laughs> I'd have to have like, you know, classic, you're driving across the desert. You just put on U2's Joshua Tree and let that whole album play and, and you're good for a long time. Uh, but for the whole road trip, I'd probably pack some, I don't know, I've started to get back into like that's that seventies rock, like Boston and stuff like that. That's just very, very like epic scope. Um, I think that stuff works well on the road. Yeah, it's definitely a good vibe for a good road trip. Yeah. Um, do you believe that garlic actually works on warding off vampires? Absolutely. Yeah? Oh, they hate that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I just watched Fright Night again for the first time. Since oh, I'm yeah, it's a great movie. Here, and it is great, and I think there's some onion stuff in that. Um doesn't work. I think the only thing that works is a steak through the heart, like, you know, because that's got to work. At the end, that's got to be the only thing that really like, does it. I, I can't fool around with water and onions. You know, you just got to go right for the heart. Um, what's one thing your fans would be surprised to know about you? I think that um, that fans of fried comics would probably be surprised to know that I'm relatively normal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the books are, are kind of crazy and uh, very very off kilter, very dark humor. Um, so they're, they'd probably, probably surprised that I'm, I'm a relatively normal dude. I, I have the same exact answer. That's probably why we work well together, like, uh, on stuff like this, because I got that right away at cons. Like I talked to people and they'd be like, yeah, you're not kind of what I expected. Like, uh, you're like, a, you're kind of like a normal guy. It's like, why? Well, I've read baby badass and, um, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of people like that though. I mean, artists, writers, like, you know, they are relatively normal, but they let that 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 creatively weird side out through their art, whatever that is. But um, yeah, that I'm relatively normal uh, person. Yeah, da- also, Dave and I can't we, we can't agree on the perfect hamburger. We don't agree on our choice of road trip music or or what weapon to kill a zombie with, or 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 even what would be effective against a vampire. But we're both normal dudes that write some crazy stuff. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, if Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street invaded your sleep, what kind of nightmares would he torment you with? Oh, wow. Um, man. You know, I always had a recurring nightmare that I was at my grandparents' house, somehow locked outside. And I could see all the people inside and they were, they were talking and laughing and having fun and enjoying themselves, but I couldn't get in to them. And, and there was a sense of danger that like they were in danger and I could, and I could hear heavy breathing. Um, and, and I was, I, I wanted to warn them that they were in trouble and I couldn't. And that was a, I mean, I, I had that nightmare several times when I was a kid. So, uh, he'd probably bring back that old chestnut. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's funny you mentioned nightmares because I, you know, I've been watching a lot of horror films lately. I think I'm just on on this horror kick and trying to catch up with some things I haven't seen. I watched Sinister. I don't know if you guys saw Sinister. uh, with Ethan Hawke. I don't know. It's from 2012, one. and it's it's really good. Uh, this guy moves into a, a he's a he's a true crime writer, and he moves into this house with his family that where the crime happened in the backyard, and he finds this box of like Super 8 uh, film in the attic, and he goes through it, and it's like all these horrific like ritualistic kind of murders, and so it's kind of like a true crime thing, but it's it's you know the the device with the with the the film. And how it's used with the music, like it's super creepy, and it I totally had this like um, thing set in my head uh, that showed up in my dreams, like this character that's just like hiding in the backyard, and it's this masked face, and uh, yeah, it would probably be just something like uh, something like a jump scare type of thing. <laughs> long long story short, jump scare, jump scare, yeah, love it. Um, what would you do with one million dollars? Uh, if I had a million dollars, I would make that bare naked lady song go away. 
<laughs> nice. That's that is a good use of that million. Uh, I would probably we would probably get a little little place in Costa Rica, just just in case. Uh, that's what I would do. How about one hundred dollars? If I had one hundred dollars, I would invest in uh, VT Sachs. Uh, that's the uh, uh, entire. Uh, stock market index fund from uh, Vanguard. And uh, this is not investing advice. Uh, please consult your accountant. <laughs> um, a nice dinner for my wife and I, but mainly for my wife. And what would that dinner entail? Uh, she's plant-based, so I'd have to go to like, the fanciest plant-based place available. And I didn't know uh, she was a plant She's she's a plant based <laughs> chef. She oh, is I a got plant based. Yeah, she's <laughs> plant based. I um, thought I thought you married Swamp Thing. I was. I, I did not. I did not. Complete opposite. Um, uh, but yeah, there's no more restaurants or going out to restaurants as, as much anymore. So I, maybe I put that hundred towards people wearing their masks, staying at home, and we we can get over this and get back to normal uh, sooner. <laughs> cool. Um, in the promo video for your Kickstarter campaign. You did a homage to horror film legend Vincent Price. If we connected with him by performing a seance, what would you ask him? Well, real quick, I want to clarify. Like, it was supposed to be like a Vincent Pricey type of thing. Okay. Like, it wasn't Vincent Price because <laughs> I think I had a little bit of a like, like, like you know, supernatural blood. Like, and someone said, "Hey, it sounds like uh, like he's English." Vincent Price was an English. So I was like, "It wasn't Vincent Price. It was a little Karloff, a little James Mason." You know, it had it was just something like that. Well, and it, so it wasn't, I, I it, stand it was by it. It's Vincent yeah, Price. It, it's Vincent Pricey. That's why I had to say it's like a Vincent Pricey kind of thing. You know, so um, so getting that out of the way. Uh, go ahead, Clay, answer the question, because I don't even remember the question right now. I, I would ask him, uh, I, I'd probably just ask him questions about Thriller, because that was my first introduction to Vincent Price. And, oh, well, and he did you guys ever hear, me. did you ever hear the YouTube, like the raw audio of the recording of that? It's really cool. No. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link. It's him, like, it's it's just him doing it, and he's talking to the people. He's like, oh, and afterwards, he's like, oh, that was really fun. Like, it's kind of cool. Like, you can hear just, oh, wow. like, the, the raw audio of the recording of that session. It's neat. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that that terrified me. It gave me nightmares just listening to him doing that little thriller rap. And how cool so. that from, you know, probably kids of the 50s were scared by him, That and then, like, you know, 20 years, yeah. 30 years later, it's uh, like he has that whole re renaissance because of that one song. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? What would you ask him? I'd ask, you're saying if, if he somehow came back from the grave and asked me a question? If you asked him a question. Oh, if, so then I'm dead? No, no, no. He's, he's obviously he's dead. And <laughs> okay. we, we, we just, uh, we, I want to clarify exactly, Aaron, how we are communicating. Well, through, <laughs> a seance, through a seance. Through a seance. Through a seance. Okay. Um, Hmm. I think I would ask him about that stock tip that Clay gave. If that's actually that one. <laughs> he made a killing in the stock market. <laughs> I'm that's sure surprise. he did. Sweet. Cool. Um, I guess we'll sort of uh, step out back into reality. And I kind of want to maybe just uh, touch on how you have both been uh, staying creative during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Both of you are creative outside of comics. And I'm wondering, I mean, does that... How does that help you as a comic book creator? Oh, I think it helps immensely. I, I mean, I think any any time you can take lessons from another uh, area. I mean, it, 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 this doesn't even have to necessarily apply to art. I mean, I think it applies to anything. If you can take a lesson that you've learned in another discipline and apply it to something else that you do, I think that's enormously helpful, and I think it gives you a big leg up. On, on other people who are only, uh, you know, studying, um, uh, you know, like like with blinders on, you, you know what I mean? I, I, I think that like if you play music, that sort of helps you write. If you if you sing, that that helps you act. You know, I, I think you can just you can just pull in all kinds of lessons and, and apply them. And I just think it gives you maybe just a greater um, a greater appreciation for for different um solutions to problems yeah um also like you know when you tend to think a certain way like uh cinematically if you're a writer or filmmaker 
um, I think you can bring some of those ideas that are in your head and how you transition that to, to the page into, into comics or whatever you're working with. Now, it's, I, I know that there's a lot of people that talk about, well, I don't want to see a comic that was someone's screenplay and then they just turn it into a, a shitty comic. Like You hear that kind of stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think if you care about the work you do, no matter what it is, um, if a story's good, a story's good. And you just have to work at, at making it work in whatever medium you're, you know, you're trying to tell it. But I think, you know, crossing in between those different mediums um, only helps. And, and I think like putting together something like this anthology, it, it helped a lot because, you know, because of the theme and because of like how we were trying to, to structure it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, if you're not using what you learn in other areas and other aspects of your life, then it's what's the point? Like it, it's supposed to kind of help one's supposed to help the other. Mm hmm. Um, generally speaking, I mean, how, how has the pandemic been treating you as a, as a creator? For me, it's, it's been, um, not that different only because, uh, as I was saying earlier in the interview, I was already sort of transitioning to creative things I can do at home. So, uh, so I'm still auditioning and recording voiceovers from my closet um, still writing comics, still making comics. Uh, I didn't do a ton of cons. Uh, I, I might, you know, I'd travel out to San Diego and I, I do that and hang out with Dave and, and a bunch of other people. But, um, you know, for the most part, um, I have been really writing this Kickstarter wave. Um, I, I think we're kind of in a little, little bit of a golden age of indie comics and, and what Kickstarter has allowed, uh, creators like myself and like David to do. Um, it, it's just been a really amazing time. And, and, uh, and so the pandemic hasn't really affected that. Um, in, in fact, it probably, uh, has made me lean a little bit harder into those things. Um, and, uh, and, and I think what's, you know, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, Kickstarter saw a real drop off in uh, in the number of projects that were on the platform because I think creators were scared. They they didn't want to be trying to sell their wares or sell their comics during this kind of like weird time when everyone was freaking out and and maybe to- well you know, totally uncertain money. yeah very uncertain right. But um, but the thing is, is that people want to be entertained and they want to have their minds taken off of the horrors of the world. And so um, so I I launched a campaign and it turned out to be my best campaign ever um, because people are hungry for entertainment. They will always be hungry for entertainment. Yeah. So um, so from that from that standpoint, um, it it it, re- it really hasn't changed, except that maybe it's even gotten better. Yeah. Only, only in that aspect. Yes, of course. Yeah, oh, like, of course, of course. I mean, you're right. It's kind of, I'm mean, just like you used, used to say, it would be recession proof, whether the movie industry or something, because when times are good, people want to go to the movies. When times are bad, they still want to go to the movies. Like there's always that aspect, but I think there was that hesitation early on with Kickstarter, especially like, you know, is this even right to do at this moment? Or, but then you realize that there, there were so many people not doing it that, it was kind of wide open and the audience was there, especially if they're home, if they couldn't go to comic shops, uh, you know, early on during the pandemic, like they were at home and Kickstarter is a great place to shop and, and look for stuff. And you start supporting things. And, you know, a couple months later, you start getting the books in and you can kind of keep that flow going. And I found that like, it's just great to support other creators too. So I, I've used that time uh, being home, trying to write, trying to, uh, make sure I support all these projects that I feel are, are um, you know, really good and, and the people involved with them are like really good and you want to just kind of uh, feed into that. So I think I've backed over 150 projects and this is just my second uh, Kickstarter um, through my site. Me and Clay are doing this together, but through my, you know, my um, my Kickstarter uh, account. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely been a boom in and. Kickstarter activity in the last yeah. in the last few months, and that's a good thing to see. Um, uh, for for any creatives out there who are struggling at this time to, I guess, find the motivation to be productive, um, do you have any advice for them? I know for me, I'm, I'm a graphic designer by trade, and um, even though I got laid off early, earlier during the pan- pandemic, I I picked up some freelance projects, and um, I have some other projects I'm working on too. And you know, 
developing some good habits and routines to help me stay disciplined has has helped me um, stay productive. Um, what about you? Are there any habits or routines that you both implement to uh, find success? I always try to um, work for at least a little bit on something um, every day if I can, just because by breaking it up into steps, it doesn't feel that overwhelming. Um, so even if it's just like, uh, you know, I'm going to dedicate an hour to this, or, or even if it's just 15 minutes, um, you can always find 15 minutes to sit down and work on something. And, and chances are, like, that's the hardest thing is just getting started. Um, once you do it, that 15 minutes, maybe, maybe you work for 15 minutes and you're done and you say, you know what, that's really all I have in me today. And that's fine. But maybe you sit down and you only plan to work for 15 minutes, but you work for an hour or two hours. Um, so, so that, that to me, just, just trying to instill some discipline saying that, like, just do a little bit of work. It doesn't, you don't have to like, you, you don't have to build Rome in a day, you know. Um, you can you can just tackle a small task, take a small chunk of it, work on that, come back and work on the next piece the next day, work on another piece the next day, and until finally it's you've gotten something built. Um, so it's not like it doesn't have to be this this you know sexy thing like you see in the movies all the time where the the inspired artist sits down and their muse has spoken you know and it's just this wild passionate thing that stuff is great and it happens sometimes and then when when it does you should you should let it happen but it doesn't always happen that way and uh, in fact it usually doesn't so uh, so as i as i said before slow and steady wins the race I would totally agree with all of that, um, but I, I, I also want to maybe go somewhat in the opposite direction to say that, like, if you're you're banging your head against the wall and you know you're trying to write every day, uh, I'm certainly not as disciplined as that. Um, but it can. But I want to make sure that people know the benefit of taking some time out for yourself for some self care and to get your mind clear, whether it's taking a walk or a hike or going to the beach or, you know, those things are important, especially during the pandemic in these times, like, you know, you can get overwhelmed with, with what's going on and how hard things are. Um, and that includes work and, and trying to find work and you can get so wrapped up in it that it becomes like uh, a pressure that uh, you need to to release, and so I think just making sure you have a little time for yourself, whether it's you know meditating for twenty minutes or or just taking a long walk, like those decompression times really help a lot. And that's not just for writers and artists, but for anyone. I think especially uh, during these times. So you know, make sure you have a little self care for yourself. Oh, yeah, I can. I, I just I, I want to agree with that because I I um I also realize the the advice that I gave while I stick by it. Um, it does sometimes people then think that that means you should never take a day off. And I, I don't believe necessarily in like the Jerry Seinfeld, you know, don't break the chain, you do the X's every day, because I, I'm a big advocate of the idea of a Sabbath, not necessarily in a religious sense, but in a sense that you worked your butt off, you know, all week long, take one day off. And it doesn't matter what day that is, right? But uh, but take one day off where you don't do anything, you don't you don't think about work, you don't think about your responsibilities, you don't think about anything else. You rest and you take care of yourself. And I do think that rest is so important. Sometimes the rest is the work, and and that can also include consuming uh, books or shows of something that you like or say you know it's almost like research. Like I like to sometimes say when I'm watching a horror film now, like well it's research, or uh, you know some kind of comedy. I'm like well it's research because. You know, you get better by seeing what else is out there and not emulating it, but but you know, drawing inspiration from uh, maybe a new type of genre is being explored, and like you have something in that space. Like there's just consuming good art, whether it's paintings or uh, books or movies, it doesn't matter. Like that's always a good thing, you know, and you can always use it for yourself uh, in, in different ways. Yeah, it's basically trying to incorporate was it uh, Pareto's principle, the eighty twenty rule. Mm. So. Um, oh right, yeah. right, right. That's a good principle. Yeah, I mean, even even like uh, even when it comes to eating, it's like you can be strict with your diet. You know, maybe six days out of the week and just have fun 
that that mm-hmm. one day, you know, and yeah. you'll still you'll still be okay. It goes a long <laughs> yeah. it goes a long way, and spread out over a lifetime, you'll be glad you did it at least mm-hmm. that much. Yeah, I mean, those are two awesome awesome uh, tips uh, right there, and um, I can attest to, to both of them because, um, you know, I I'm I'm trying to be a writer as well, you know, so I I, I mess around and dabble, and I, I make it a point to to write at least ten minutes every day. Mm. On on anything, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Just just to get into the habit, and you know, a lot of times it's good, a lot, but a lot of times it's it's nonsense. But just just the fact, of, like get into the habit of, of developing that uh, that muscle. Because well, yeah, it's, it's an exercise. Yeah, yeah. and right. and to to David's point, um, sometimes when I get stuck, I, I do take walks a lot, and um, it it does help me um, get a new perspective and just to, I guess, sort of like a a, a pattern interrupt to help me you know, get back on track and it could be walking or just, um, cooking something, cooking mm-hmm. something. It, it can, can be meditative yeah. and, and to some regard and, and help unlock uh, another way of, of thinking about some things while, you know, you, you ponder about a problem. So yeah, I mean, both your points were, were excellent. Thanks. Yeah. There's a, uh, there's an old book called becoming a writer by Dorothea Brand. And, and when I say old, I mean, like, I think it was maybe in the 30s or something when this came out. Hmm. It, was the, um, it was the artist's way before the artist's way, um, because it's essentially the same book. It gives you all the same advice, except it's in that, you know, old timey 1930s speak that's so charming. But, um, but one of the things she talks about is how that's sort of the, the writer's secret weapon, the walk, because the reason why so many great ideas come to you in the shower is because your body is doing something that's like automatic, it's on autopilot, so you're not really having to consciously think about it. And so that frees up your mind to to then sort of start solving all these problems that are sort of dormant in your head. And so she talks about, you know, like you, you can't spend your life just hanging out in the shower all the time. So uh, the walk is sort of that other thing, but also doing the dishes. You know, these these things where your where your body is just doing things that are sort of it's it's physical, but it's it's low. You know, it, it doesn't really tax your brain. Those things are just very meditative and and just help you get ideas and help you solve problems. Mm-hmm. And, so, and, and that is the work. reason I knew there was a reason why I love doing dishes. <laughs> That's right. I do. I do a lot of dishes. <laughs> Come to my house. <laughs> oh man, that just that just reminds me. Um, my first job um, out of high school was uh, working at Sabaros. You know that that pizza oh, yeah, place yeah. in the mall. Oh yeah. But um, they would always stick me doing dishes every night. So, <laughs> and I, I I enjoyed it. I mean, it was it was one of those things where you can just you know uh, just be on autopilot and yeah, you kind of zone. It it can be very uh, well. It's close to meditative, but um, there's another word that I'm searching for too. But it's it's completely like you just kind of get into a zone and you can think about things or not think about things. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it, uh, I, I find it pleasant actually to do that. Like I don't it's mind. Zen. It. It, it's Zen. That's it. It's very Zen. <laughs> it's uh, fi- finding the magic in the mundane, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, as a graphic designer and a podcast host, I know the value of collaboration and receiving help from my peers, you know, even though, you know, I'm probably reluctant to ask for it, but uh, who are some people that uh, you have um, worked with in the past that you'd like to give a superhero shout out to? So I would love to give a superhero shout out to uh, a couple of people. One is uh, Tyler James, who runs the Comics Launch podcast and series of courses. Um, he is somebody that when I ran my first Kickstarter in 2014, um, we were about halfway through the campaign and I realized this thing was going to fail unless I did something. Mm-hmm. And so I, I quickly Googled, you know, how do I run a comic book Kickstarter campaign? And and Tyler's blogs came up. This is before he started the podcast. And so I just I devoured these blogs and uh, used, you know, implemented all of his ad- advice and uh, and lo and behold, we funded and um and so then I, I somehow got on his mailing list and I saw he was opening up these courses. And so I, I took them and he's really transformed the way that I look at uh, crowdfunding and being a creative. And uh, I just, I, I can't recommend his courses enough, but, um, but if you don't want to spring for a course, like the podcast is free, he's got, I don't know, at this point, 
close to 300 episodes, maybe more. I don't even know at this point, but uh, but all these great episodes for free, uh, you can go listen to and uh, and get a lot of knowledge. And then another guy I'd like to shout out is uh, is Ryan Kroboth, who does a book called Sunmaker. Um, he's a great artist, a great guy. He's very knowledgeable about uh, about color. Actually, he's taught me a lot about coloring. Um, and he's just a guy that you can just, you know, drop a line to and he will, uh, he will write you back. And, uh, and now Ryan's going to get all these, uh, messages, but, um, <laughs> but, but he, he really does like have the heart of a teacher. Like he, he has enormous patience and will sit down and like really explain things. So if ever I have a question or something about color, um, he's a guy that, that has really, uh, has really given me a lot of great advice, great tips. Nice. Yeah, I just uh, quickly shout out to one of my first, um, you know, collaborators in comics was Christian Horn. You know, we kind of came up with Baby Badass together, uh, and he had, he contributed a story to this anthology. I think it's called Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein's Frankenstein's Band Vampire, Vampire, which yeah. is great. It's very, <laughs> very uh, like like one of those. Was it EC? No, not EC. What, what's the yeah, it's, I mean, the, it's he does it in the style of EC. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, but it also evokes sort of those Hammer horror films. Too. Hammer horror, that's right. Yeah, no, it's great. And uh, he's got a podcast, too, called uh, Part-Time Fanboy, and he's always very supportive, awesome guy to work with. Uh, David Pepos who and, and, and Ryland Grant are great um, supporters always. Um, and Charlie Stickney, who is just a great source of information yeah. you know because he's kind of been through it with white ash which is one of the the best books out there like uh, that was kind of like the gold standard as far as i could tell with you know a certain level of kickstarter and the, the quality that you can present and that you'll kind of grow a fan base uh from and so charlie is just a good source of information i know he's working with scout now too and um uh helping clay with uh, red xmas and you know just a great guy um there's just too many people, but those are just yeah. a few. It's definitely, it's just like your anthology. There's way too many people. <laughs> to way too many people. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I look forward to, uh, you know, uh, checking out the anthology when it comes out. Um, I, I guess um, it'll come out in June of next year, right? I believe that's, yeah, that's the a, goal. We built in, um, you know, some extra time. Uh, hopefully we can deliver, you know, uh, ahead of time, but, but we're probably printing overseas and then having the book shipped here. Um, so we just wanted to build in plenty of time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. The whole timeline is listed, uh, on the Kickstarter. If you go to the Kickstarter page and any other questions you may have, but, uh, check it out. Cool. Is there anything else that we, um, that we missed? Is there anything else that, uh, you'd like to, uh, have our audience, know more about uh, nightmare theater or any other projects you'd like to promote well you should definitely back nightmare theater for sure which for is uh, you can find at bit.ly slash nightmare theater um definitely go check it out if nothing else watch the video we had a blast putting that together um, but we think that'll that'll convince you. Uh, Dave does a great Vincent Price, Price impression, Price which Price he will not. It's pricey. He will not own up to it being Vincent Price. Um, and then, and then for me, I, I I would also just like to remind people that Red Xmas is going to be in stores from Scout Comics. Uh, should be there early December. So um, so check it out. Please, yeah, please order that. Um, besides Nightmare Theater, which is great and everyone should check out, uh, I'm in the final edit of my film slash deconstructed web series called Mary Tyler Millennial, which stars Mary Ryan and Lucy Blahar, and they're two awesome comedians, and just the cast is fantastic, and it's kind of an exploration of, like, cults, and I describe it as Office Space meets The Shining, and... It's just it's a it's an independent film, but it's very funny. It's darkly funny, so I cannot wait to get that out. And then eventually in 2021, Baby Badass Volume Two, and a comic called Cannibals on Mars that I did with Tony Donnelly and Andre Salazar. Um, and uh, yeah, and then who knows what what's after that? We'll see what happens in 2021. Speaking of Mars, I think I, I think I remember seeing on your Instagram, David, uh, about. I don't know if it's a joke or not. Oh, no, no. I, that was some some book I backed on Kickstarter, and that was one of the like the the tiers. And you could he actually had bought a bunch of, like a big plot up on Mars, and he gave out these 
official <laughs> certificates for okay. I own land on Mars. Apparently, like that was part of the. What's the what's thing. what's the name of the plot? Is it like I Neo Neo Olympus or something? Neo Olympus. Okay. Yeah, I'm very excited. So we'll see, and uh, we'll see if I have to move there or not. Sweet. Well, hey, Clay and David, I, I thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you thank so much you. for having yeah. us. We and really I, I hope it. to meet you in person someday, Clay. Yeah, that'd be great. Twenty twenty two. Yeah. Uh, what, when, San what, Diego. What, you think twenty twenty two will be the the next time we'll see each I, other? I I don't know. Do you guys see everyone getting together in twenty twenty one in the summer? And uh, I don't know. I think that's too soon. I think it's too soon. Like it just it looks weird when you see like all those people together. But who knows? Maybe if it's twenty twenty one and it's safe, sure. But twenty twenty two for sure. Yeah. No matter no matter what happens, mm-hmm. let's do it. It's a date. Yeah. It might be very post-apocalyptic, well, we'll, but there's going to be a con. <laughs> we'll get we'll get some burgers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds Thanks, great. Aaron. Yeah, uh, where can people find you online? So I can be found at Clay's Evil Twin on Twitter, and then you can also find my work at FriedComics.com. And I am at Schraderopolis uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and same with the Baby Badass Instagram and Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show again, and we'll start closing um thank you so much for tuning in to the hall h show podcast where we love showcasing independent comic book creators like david schrader and clay adams uh please check out uh, the nightmare theater kickstarter campaign which ends on november 19th 2020 and hopefully you'll be able to crack open its spine and read it sometime in june of 2021 Uh, if you believe in our mission to be the voice of independent pop culture creators don't be scared Uh, Please give us a five-star rating on uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, I promise not to put a voodoo curse on you if you don't. Uh, You can also find us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or our website, hallh.com. Please please also share our episodes using hashtag hallhshow. Peace, cheers, and have a happy and safe Halloween.